Hello, and welcome to the first module in this online workshop on free speech in K-12 schools. The focus of this module is on student expression in K-12 schools and will provide an overview of four key Supreme Court decisions and the legal principles that can be applied in cases of student expression. This is the first module in a series of five modules on the topic. To gain access to this module, you have already completed the overview and introductory module that discussed the First Amendment and how it came to be applied in schools. So the first case that we'll be discussing was the Tinker v. Des Moines case decided in 1969. Prior to 1969, there was no major case law that applied the First Amendment to student expression in schools. This first case was landmark in that it established that students do retain their speech rights at school. In this case, a group of students wanted to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. The school learned of their plan and informed the students that they may not engage in such protests at school. However, in December of 1965, students in Des Moines, Iowa, including Mary Beth Tinker and Christopher Eckhart, pictured here, wore armbands to school and were suspended. Initially, lower courts found in favor of the school district's right to enforce discipline. However, the case rose all the way to the Supreme Court, who in 1969 wrote the now famous words here on this slide, quote, First Amendment rights are available to teachers and students. It can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. And in coming to this determination, the justices determined that there are two main prongs that schools should use to determine if they should limit student expression. The first one is if the expression causes a quote, material and substantial disruption in the learning environment or the educational process, or two, if the expression quote, collides with the rights of others. Now this interpretation is subject to all kinds of applications across states and regions because there are various interpretations of what this means, but this are, these are the guiding principles that emerged out of this key case. The next important case was decided by the Supreme Court in 1986 and had to do with a case of student expression that was considered lewd and obscene during a school assembly during student government elections. Matthew Frazier, pictured here, read a speech to nominate a classmate that was full of sexual innuendo. For example, you can see the excerpt read on the slide, quote, Jeff Kuhlman is a man who takes his point and pounds it in. If necessary, he'll take an issue and nail it to the wall. He doesn't attack things in spurts. He drives hard, pushing and pushing until finally he succeeds. Jeff is a man who will go to the very end, even the climax, for each and every one of you. As a result of this and other words in the speech, the school decided to suspend the student and the student sued. This case made it all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court did determine that teachers and schools can restrict the content of student expression if it is vulgar or obscene and if the expression conflicts with the teaching mission of the school. However, teachers must be careful not to restrict expression just because they disagree with the student's message or the viewpoint on the topic. They also address the issue of quote unquote fighting words or words that inflict injury by their very utterance or incense students to fight physically or verbally. So this Bethel v. Frazier case determined that schools can restrict speech that is vulgar, obscene, and or conflicts with the mission of the school, including fighting words. The third case that's important to be aware of is the Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer, decided in 1988. And this is about the content of a student-run publication, in this case, a newspaper, sponsored by the school. So this was a journalism class that put together the paper. In this case, the principal removed two full pages of copy of the May 1983 issue because he determined there were two articles, one about teen pregnancy and one about living through divorce, that he felt were quote-unquote inappropriate. 
In this decision, the court determined that as representatives of the state, school administrators can censor, restrain, or refuse to publish school-sponsored student expression if it interferes with the requirements of school discipline, interferes with student rights, interferes with academic propriety, generates health or welfare concerns, or is deemed obscene or vulgar. So the take home message from the Hazelwood case is that school administrators do have the right to ex restrict expression as long as it's related to quote unquote legitimate pedagogical concerns. Finally, the fourth case I will present here happened in 2002 at a school in Alaska during the Olympic torch relay. The school released the students during the school day to observe the torch relay and many of the students watched it from across the street, so off of school grounds. During this event, one student did decide to create and hold up a banner stating, quote, bong hits for Jesus, and as a result was suspended for his actions. In this case, the Supreme Court found that schools may restrict speech that undermines the educational mission of the school, in this case, pro-drug messages, and that schools do have the right to restrict speech off of school grounds, even especially when it is a school-sponsored event. So students who are on field trips or otherwise engaged in official school activities are subject to um, the school's decisions, regardless of if they're physically on school property or not. So in summary, these are the four main cases that provide major principles to help guide decisions when responding to acts of student expression in schools. The Tinker case was that students and teachers have First Amendment rights at school, and these rights may be abridged or limited if they, quote, uh, provide a material and substantial disruption or collide with the rights of others. In the Bethel v. Frazier case, schools may restrict obscene speech as well as fighting words. In the Hazelwood case, schools have more control over school-sponsored speech, that is, school publications, and any actions to limit that speech must be based on legitimate pedagogical concerns. And finally, in the Morse v. Frederick, or Bong Hits for Jesus case, schools have the authority over speech at school-sponsored events or those directed at the school, and they may restrict such expression if it, quote, undermines the educational mission of the school. So let's take a moment now and apply these principles from these four Supreme Court decisions, otherwise known as SCOTUS, to a scenario. This case takes place at a middle school. And in this scenario, there is a female student named Josephine who is 13. She is wearing a bracelet that reads, I heart boobies, keep abreast. She wears this bracelet to school in support of breast cancer awareness. The school district administrators believe this bracelet was causing a disruption in the school environment and banned all students from wearing these bracelets based on their school dress code policy that prohibits lewd or vulgar language on clothing. Despite this ban, Josephine wore her bracelet to school and was suspended for breaking this policy. Now I would like you to pause the video for a few moments and make some notes. Do you think Josephine's speech rights are being violated by the school district's action? Do you think the school has a right to limit this form of expression? And finally, what would you do in your school? Take a minute, minute to write some notes or discuss with a colleague. Okay, so in this case, the decision was that because the bracelets here were not found to be quote unquote lewd because they were commenting on a social issue, they should not be categorically banned under Fraser. The school district also failed to show that the bracelets substantially disrupted the school environment and therefore they did not have a right to limit the student's expression in this case. This was a case that happened in Pennsylvania. So the Pennsylvania, um, it was in the Third Circuit Court and they appealed to the Supreme Court, but they declined to hear the case, which basically means this ruling is the best guidance we have in similar circumstances. So I like this scenario because it brings together both the decisions from Frazier 
as well as um, Tinker to help you think about how we can pull all these various legal principles together to deal with um, all kinds of different scenarios in your classrooms and in your school buildings. The next module will be taking on teacher and staff expression. I hope you found the information in this first module useful and we'll continue on to module two where we will have more cases and more scenarios for you to engage with. Have a good day.